All right. With me today, I have Kyle Porter. Super excited to have you on the show today. Kyle, thanks for uh, coming on. Yeah, sure, Andrew. I'm glad to be here and uh, really appreciate you inviting me. So Kyle, you've revolutionized sales enablement, sales engagement with Sales Loft, but there was a time when you were at zero and you didn't have this enormous company that you do now. And that's kind of what I wanted to focus on. Um, just to start things off, how did you come up with the idea for Sales Loft? And what does it do for people that might not even know? Yeah, sure. Well, in a nutshell, what sales organizations around the world are looking to do is create repeatable and scalable sales process that they can forecast off of and, and achieve results in a predictable fashion, right? And customers out there, they're expecting and deserving an incredible sales experience. But prior to sales loft and sales engagement, those two things were wildly at odds. How do you give the customer an incredible sales experience and do it at scale? And so that's what sales loft solves with our sales engagement platform. It's just a communication layer that sits on top of all popular CRMs, helps the company codify their go-to-market, execute on all their actions, use data to improve, and a whole suite of products to basically um, allow companies to maximize revenue while helping their customers. So that's where you are. That's where you are today. What did the first version look like? What did the first MVP? Yeah, sure. So you know, I, I wanted to create a business prior to even knowing that we were going to go in the sales world, and I wanted to do that because you know I felt like there's all these amazing people out there uh, that I had run into throughout my life and in prior career that had talents and skills and capabilities, and I wanted to create an environment where others could come in take those abilities and put them to work uh, to learn more, do more, become more and grow in their fulfillment. And so that was the original uh, mission be behind starting a company in the first place. And then we started thinking about sales because I'd been a salesperson my whole life going back to childhood. And so early versions of Sales Loft were um, we had a product that would give you news on companies you were trying to sell to. So think about like a daily newspaper delivered to your email that would say, you know, of your 40 accounts that you're working in your CRM, here's all the, artic all the articles that came out on them in the last 24 hours. So like, had, uh, like a blog was the first version? I think I read that somewhere, but I wasn't sure. It was like, so it would, the first thing it would do is go to your CRM, see that Andrew owns these 40 ops, mine out all those uh, accounts, and then go look for news on those accounts every single day. And then in the morning, you'd wake up to an email from Sales Loft that said, here's the daily news on the companies you care about. And it was like a stream of information. So it was like a daily dossier on your account. So you could do cool things like click a button and it, and it, would, it would pull down the names of the people associated with that contact in the email. And if you click that button, it would fire a, a draft email to them like referencing the article. So it was a way to like stay in touch with your contacts based on news that was happening to them. Nice. And then I know you launched um, Prospector. I was actually pretty bummed when you deprecated that. But the, I want to I roll it back on what you just said, though. Um, so it sounded like when you started a company, you started with a mission first rather than... Yeah, it was more like a personal purpose. You know, that it was that personal purpose that, you know, I, I had been through a crazy childhood, been through a crazy college career. And you know, I came to this point where I really matured quite fr uh, qu quite qu quickly. And I came to the understanding that I've been put on this planet for a purpose and I have talents and skills and I want to use those to make the world a better place and serve others. And then I realized lots of other people have that same desire. And I thought if I can create a company, it can be an amazing vehicle to attract that talent, those people, and then give them an opportunity to find fulfillment. So that was the original purpose of starting a company in the first place prior to knowing, hey, it's going to be in sales or sales software or whatever. I love that because, you know, culture is one of those things that if you get it right, like you can do amazing things. And there's so many things that change when you're building a company, you know, that you can't control, but your culture is something that you can control. How, how important is culture to you at Sales Loft? And how do you, is that, has that changed over time? You've changed products. You just described one. You had Prospector. Sales Loft is what it is, to, you know, today. This huge suite. But your culture was that, you know, the same on day one? Has it evolved over time? Yeah, I mean, so culture is the big is our biggest sustainable differentiating advantage. Period. Um, now, there's other ones as well, but that's the biggest one, and it's the thing that we have the most control over. To your point, right? 
the macroeconomic climate can shift and change. Competitors can come and go. New technologies can enter the landscape. Um, but who we bring on board, what we value in those people, you know, what we expect of them in terms of behavior and how we, um, you know, align with them on vision and mission, you know, those things I have complete control over as a CEO. And so I choose to invest uh, time and attention and energy there and work really hard to have a, uh, you know, a team that's rowing in the same direction, uh, you know, with the same, same goals, uh, but also that values the same behaviors. That's amazing. I, and, it, and of course, it's changed over time, too, right? I mean, it's, it's never the same. And, uh, you know, I think every day that I'm uh, the CEO of this company, which is almost nine years now, uh, every day I learn something about how the values and culture are more important than I thought they were the day before. What are the cultures and the values, if I can ask? You don't have to share all of them, but what's like maybe your favorite two or, you know, because I think a lot of founders describe two. Um, so the first one's customer obsession and that one's critical. There's you know, no, no need to explain that deeper. Um, the second one is biased action. Don't be told what to do. Just act. Uh, don't wait to be told what to do. Just act. Um, team over self. Team over self is, you know, my favorite analogy for that one is when Michael Jordan wanted to win the scorers award, which is the best individual accolade. Um, he never won an, a, a championship, uh, only until he started giving up on that goal of the scoring award. Um, and passing the ball more, not taking as many shots, did the team win the championship? And so, if we as a team, uh, you know, put our organization first, it's ultimately going to be best for us individually. Um, so that's team over self. Um, the another one is um, uh, glass half full. This is one of my favorites, and it's not all this BS like the world's you know sunshine and roses all the time. It's really I understand and fully grok the situation that we're faced with, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I choose the positive path forward. I make a selection of the windshield versus the rearview mirror and visualize success on the other end. And so that's the, that's the glass half full. So I've got customers, uh, bias to action, uh, team over self, um, glass half full. And then the last one is a focus on results, which we just hijacked straight out of the Patrick Lencioni, five dysfunctions of a team. We inverted them into five to thrive. And it's so the formula there is I'm transparent and vulnerable so that my team members know me deeply so that we can dig in deep and have conflict over the issues that we're trying to solve, so that we can come to commitments quickly, so that we can hold each other accountable, so that we can be focused on the results. So that's it in a nutshell. I love that, man. And I actually learned, I love the Michael Jordan quote, because I learned that in the news documentary, where Phil Jackson actually convinced Michael Jordan, you know, the best basketball player of all time, to shoot less to win, because it takes a team to win a championship. Um, you know, how do you inspire others on your team to, you know, have that mentality? Because that is how you win a team or a championship. You can win a couple games with talent, but it's the power of a team that wins a championship. How do you, do you do anything fun with your team? Do you have any sort of like awards that encourage that sort of behavior? I'd love to dive into that like a little bit deeper. Yeah, it, we, we, we do a lot of stuff, but I think the biggest thing that we do is try to find it on the front end. Who values that in their life? Who's got examples of living and breathing and and being that person over time, uh, you know, I think most people would tell you that that's something that they would aspire to. Um, but do they have the, you know, concrete evidence of having exhibited it throughout their career? And that's where the top grade interview comes in, which we do on every single candidate we hire, regardless of, you know, what level in the organization. And that's sometimes a two hour interview where we learn about their past there and we go chronologically from high school all the way up to where they are today. And it's what you learn, what mistakes you make, what would you do if you had to do it over again? Why did you make this move from there to there? You know, what was the experiences here? What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? You know, all those things. And that really um, helps you identify um, whether or not they have that kind of bred into who they are. Um, but then once on board, we're very, very clear on, you know, here's the vision of the company. Uh, I see a world where sellers are loved by the buyers they serve. And that's a world we want to create. And then the mission, we're going to empower our customers to deliver their customers with an incredible sales experience that helps them maximize revenue. Right. And we're going to live through these values. And then I'm going to update them on uh, weekly all hands meetings, uh, weekly emails to the team, the mentors and the investors that has I I've, I've, haven't missed a weekend update email, um, you know, since 2012. So that's eight years of weekend update emails every Sunday night. And um, and then sales off stars an award we give out to those who exhibit the core values best. Um, we take on the one minute praises and reprimands uh, that. Uh, is a kind of a spouse policy inside the company. 
Uh, but yeah, all those things lead up to just reinforcing the culture and values. Nice. And how, how important do you think it is for other entrepreneurs, you know, they're just starting their companies. How important is it, is it to get those things right at the very beginning, rather than like in the middle, you kind of figure out you have a culture issue. How important would you say getting culture is right first round? It all depends on how long the company's going to be around. The longer the company's going to be around, the more important it is. Um, you know, if you've got a business that you can, you can build up and, and, and sell off in two years, and that's what you want to do, it might not be the investment worth making is certainly at the same level that we have. Um, but if you want to create a company that's built to last, and you see this as a vision of a you know, 20 year business, then it's hypercritical. Uh, so it is a balance because you never know in the early days whether things are gonna take off, whether you've got the right ideas. And so how much do you invest in that culture when you don't know, you know what's the situation going to be two, three, four, five, ten 10 years down the road? So it is a healthy balance, but if you believe in it and you're there for the long term, then it's a, it's a must investment. Nice, and then, so that's a good segue into just going back to the beginning. When when at SalesOp did you really know you were onto something? Like, was it your tenth customer? Was it your hundredth customer? Like, did you ever have a moment when you were like, "Holy, holy cow!" I'm on. Like, you you created an industry, a category. Was there a moment when you kind of like, you know, really felt that this is going to be big? And yeah, so with the first product, which you mentioned, Prospector, we took that thing from zero to seven million in about two and a half years and ended up canceling it to go full in on our sales engagement platform, which is now a you know over $70 million ARR business. But back to the original one, I think we knew that one. It was like maybe a little bit more technical when we knew it. Um, we had launched the product and we saw a bunch of people in India that were uh, downloading the free version and abusing the hell, you know, the heck out of it, just like, you know, really ripping into it. And that's when we knew there's probably a lot of demand for this thing. So I think that was kind of funny, that moment where we said, okay, there's something here. Um, but with the second product, which is now the core uh, you know, platform of SalesLoft, I knew that on a whiteboard because we had just seen, I had just seen the pains and problems and how customers were trying to solve them on their own. And you know, all we needed to do was whiteboard it out for me to know this is the real deal. Nice. How'd you get your first like, few customers? Were you doing the initial selling? Did you have a co-founder? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm the sales side of the of the founding team, if you will. And and um, yeah, I mean, the very, very first paying customer pre prospect era was a friend of mine, Mike Zito, who was running a, a technology company called Proximus Mobility out of the Advanced Technology Development Center of Georgia Tech. And I think he paid me thirty five dollars a month for for our news uh, solution. And um you know, I just, I knew him and I walked into his office and I showed it to him. He said, it looked cool. So I asked for him a credit card and we went and off we went. And so I think that was early. And then somebody told me when I first showed them Prospector, I think we were charging like 125 bucks a month. And he said, if you can get me the uh, phone numbers for these contacts, I'll pay you 500 bucks a month. And, uh, you know, this product's worth 500 bucks a month. And I said, okay, let me try, retry my new pricing. You know, hey man, uh, I'm going to come out with phone numbers. I want 500 bucks a month. Can I count you in? He goes, yep, bring it back when you have it. So that was that one. And then I don't even remember on the cadence side, we were still working through, um, I guess we were next door to an incubator at the time. And we just walked over there and just I just walked desk to desk to desk and got people using sales off cadence and, um, and started getting feedback and it just grew from there. That's awesome. And one part I love about your story is just how much conviction you've always had and what you've been building. And I remember Prospector, I used the heck out of Prospector you got it to, you know, 7 million in revenue and you had the conviction to shut it down. Like that takes so much courage and just conviction and like the bigger opportunity in the market. How do you continue doing that in sales loft? Knowing that you, you had, you know, a substantial company, but you said, Hey, this is a distraction. This isn't our future. This is the bigger opportunity. Um, how, how did, can you walk me through how you even had the courage to one, make that decision and then two, just any sort of like tips for entrepreneurs that might be in a similar situation where they have a product today, there's traction, but it leads you to something bigger. That's a hard yeah. question. I hope. Yeah. Our original pro prospector product, um, it had a lot of hair on it. You know, one, we didn't own and control the environment because it was a data product that was capturing information from the web. So it was able to pull in information from LinkedIn, um, through users in their Chrome extension. Uh, but I didn't control the environment of sales off prospector. 
And furthermore, it was a data solution. So companies would use it and kind of use it up and move on and come back. And we had a monthly contract on that thing. And it was people would buy it, upgrade it, cancel it, buy it again, upgrade it, cancel it. And so we had some awkward kind of economics in there from the way people were using it. But, you know, when I looked out into what Cadence was going to be, which is basically an operating system for the way that reps manage their day and execute on all their activities and hold themselves accountable and use data to improve, you know, I knew that it was going to be something special. I didn't know how big. I didn't think it was going to be as big as it's gotten in the period of time it's gotten. Um, But I did have a vision for how every seller in the world would want to use something like that. And so today the conviction stuff becomes a lot easier because in the early days you don't have like, uh, oh, but back to the difference. So I had already, we'd already started building Cadence. And while Prospector was growing, Cadence was growing at a lot faster clip. It was something like 20% growth in ARR monthly. And we went from, I think that first year, Prospector might have gone from 3 million or that last, the first year of Cadence, Prospector went from three or three and a half million to 7 million that year. Um, but Cadence went from 200K to 2.5 million. And so from a growth percentage perspective, that Cadence was growing way faster. And, um, and you know, we controlled the environment. Um, we didn't, we expected it to be sticky and customers would depend on it to achieve their goals and, you know, objectives. And so from that perspective, it's pretty easy to make the decision. We just, we lit a you know candlelit visual visual um, of Prospector. We sang "Dust in the Wind" and uh, and we gave a little Sayonara to to that product and moved on to the future. Nice. And so you know throughout your journey, you know especially like in the early days, are there any you know mistakes that you made that maybe you look back on? You kind of think, hey, I shouldn't have done that, or you know just common things that you wish you can go back and correct. Yeah, I mean, probably hundreds of them. I think, you know, on that same topic of Prospector, we should have moved off earlier to to Cadence the minute that we had the vision for it. And even after we launched it, we were still selling the old product. And, and you know, 75% of my business was engineered to manage, you know, support and serve in that old product. And um, the minute we made the full on, um, you know, change over, it was when things started really taking off. And so I think I would have made that earlier. Um uh signing a couple of um leases on office space right before covid that's a mistake uh if you ever know that uh covid's coming don't buy a bunch of office space so that's one um uh there's a ton man hiring the wrong people leading people the wrong way uh building this feature versus that one you know there's just a ton of stuff that i would do differently with the knowledge i have now so you've been running sales off for nine years now. If you can go back to when you were just starting out, what's maybe two pieces of advice you give yourself? <laughs> um, I'd say invest in growth faster because this market's real. Um, I think sales off can be could have could be a hundred and fifty million dollar business right now if we had really dove in on growth in the early early days. Um, so that's one, but you never know that at the moment. Um, I think it's important to, you know, we always really established with our organization, the importance of being number one in a category we're creating. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot more communication that can be done there, uh, both externally to the marketplace, advisors, investors, mentors, just a clear unrelenting desire and, and plan to be number one with really no um, you know, alternative available. I think that was would be one that I would focus a little more attention on. Um, we've always been, you know, we have a hyper competitive uh, kind of kind of landscape, or really a a duopoly in our category, if you will. And um, the other players are very um, aggressive on their kind of head to head tactics. It's been a big surprise for me the level of kind of nastiness that um, you know you might see in the world of of um, kind of selling against competitors, but. Um, you know, from my perspective, I think looking back on it, I've always had the attitude of don't focus on competitors, focus on customers. Um, you know, going back, I think there's probably a few times where I would have, uh, you know, not let uh, their tactics kind of like, you know, if they're going to say something bad about us, I would have been more vocal and this is bullshit or this isn't true versus just turning the other cheek and kind of going. Um, so that's maybe one element that we would have done differently, but I don't, I don't know if that's a huge difference. Um, I know what you're saying though. I mean, when you're, when you're, when you're competing, you know, 
you can lose a big deal or you have a competitor that's, you know, neck and neck with you. And business is a competitive sport and you want to win. But I've always admired that about you and the Sales Loft brand is you guys hold yourself with such high regard and such a relentless focus on customers. And I think that's the, that's how you really win is putting the customer above everything and tuning out the noise. So, Yeah, I've imprinted yeah. two customer quotes just in my heart that I never forget and always think about. And ironically, since the first time I heard these two quotes from two different customers, I've heard multiple variations of them along the way. And the first one was when a company moved off of our competitor to us and they told us, I asked why, and I thought it was going to be like feature this or feature that. And she said, she said, the other company just wanted to sell me software. It was very clear that sales off wanted me to be successful. And so that was really, um, you know, like really, you know, hit home with me. And then the other one was when a customer said, and this one's happened a bunch of times. They say, um, the competitor wouldn't stop talking about sales loft. Sales loft wouldn't stop talking about me. And that's the customer saying that. And so it was really cool, you know, to hear that. And that's one that, you know, I'd never forget. I remember seeing you put that on LinkedIn like four years ago. And that actually rang really, really true when I was running business apps. Cause we would always say our success is our customer's success. And I think that's completely true in business. You can't be successful if you're not relentlessly focusing on your customer's success. Would you agree with that or oh, yeah. add anything to it? I mean, you hit a nail, nail on the head. Nice. And so, you know, you're in your ninth year at sales off. What, what's on the horizon? What gets you super excited every single morning, waking up, you know, driving this industry? I, you know, I, I guess a, a small ounce of me is surprised that I haven't gotten bored or haven't gotten tired or haven't gotten, you know, jaded in this journey. But Me too, to be honest. Like you're, you're, you're continuing to acquire companies. You're continuing to innovate. You're continuing to lead. Like, yeah, how do you keep it going, man? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm already committed to never quitting working in whatever, you know, my throughout my life. Like I don't ever want to retire. Um, you know, I think retirement is like death to me. So I always want to do something and, and do something I love and I'm passionate about. And I can't imagine another job that I would enjoy as much as this one. Um, and that's leading the loft, you know, the team of lofters that we have and, and serving them and, and loving on them. So they turn around and love on our customers. So from that perspective, there's just nothing better that's come along. And so, you know, as long as sales off CEO job is still available to me, I think it's the best job in the entire world. So I'm going to wake up every day and give it everything I've got. Um, you know, I, I, we do some things to like chill out and, and lay back and kind of, you know, uh, get out of the go, go, go scene. I, I, ever since COVID, I've been living on a tangerine farm in central Florida. So that's kind of different, right? Um, you know, we moved out of our house in Atlanta and midtown Atlanta and came down here and we've been here now since then. And, um, it's, I'm making breakfast for my kids every day. I'm out in the water on the wakeboard and, and surfboard. I'm in the four wheeler. I got horses next door. So I'm doing a lot of things like that to kind of maintain the, um, you know, the, the momentum as a kind of whole, whole individual. Uh, but like I said, you know, no better job in the world. So I'm going to keep doing it for, for as long as I can. Um, Long-term sales loft outlook. Uh, we wanted this company to be built to last. And, you know, that means that there's no expectation of an exit. Um, there's no goal of selling the company. Um, would I like to ring the bell on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ? That'd be pretty damn cool. And, uh, you know, am I, am I only going to be happy if that's what we do? No, I, you know, if we just keep growing this business and, and giving everything we got. I think there's something special there, but I think there's a big opportunity to take it public too. So, um, and I bet that we do. I would bet that too. And just to kind of term it as a lofty goal. So yeah, I'm rooting for you there. I guess, you know, final questions, Kyle, I know you're, you're super busy. Um, but in terms of like entrepreneurs that like motivate you, are there any that, you know, come to mind? You know, I, I, I like to read biographies and, um, you know, I just read the little black stretchy pants biography of the, the guy who found a Lululemon, uh, you know, I've read like Sam Walton's Elon Musk. I, you know, I just read every, every entrepreneur biography that I can. Um, and, and, in I, I don't think that any of them are idealistic. No one really is, but I get and learn lots of things from each of them individually. The Jeff Bezos, you know, I think there's always things that you take and leave in those. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that any individual um, entrepreneur is someone that really, you know, 
kind of I espouse to be like, but I do plan to learn as much as I can from from them. There are some other mentors in my life, um, really who come from a spiritual background, who have been very instrumental in my leadership, the way that I treat others, um, you know, difficult conversations, uh, you know, how to hold people accountable, uh, you know, some of the really tough stuff that you can't figure out just, you know, from books and online. And and those guys and, and gals have been, you know, really instrumental in my life. So I'd say it's just soak up as much as I can from as many as I can and go deeper on the ones that I align with from a integrity and a personal mission and, and values perspective. Nice. So what do you like to do for fun? I get it. You're one of the the best CEOs I've probably personally met. You've built an incredible company. What do you like to do for fun on the weekends? What's something oh, people yeah. might not know about you? Yeah. yeah. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm cooking breakfast every day since COVID. I'm making a fresh fruit or veggie smoothie pretty much every day. We got the tan- tangerine farm, so I'm squeezing oranges and tangerines all the time. I've got avocados, I've got mangoes, I've got lemons and limes. Uh, so I love being out in the farm. I'm on the four wheeler a lot. I've been fishing. I got a, a little dock in the backyard and some uh, largemouth bass. I went hunting uh, for the first time ever over the weekend, uh, so that was fun. And then I, uh, my biggest, my most favorite hobby is. I've got one of those wakeboard boats and we've got a surfboard and and, uh, it puts out a big wake and my wife and I just go out there and surf for hours at a time. The kids get out there, can do 360s and kind of slash the wake and drop the rope. And so that's a big one for me. Uh, Read a ton. Um, I probably get called out to the golf course once a month by a buddy and, you know, hack through that one. I'm working on my game. Um, Yeah. So those are a bunch of things that I've been doing. Nice. I dig the surfing, obviously, with this in the back. Well, is snowboarding well, um, or is that water? I can't really tell. It's no, that's that's Kelly Slater, man, best surfer in the world. Yours is like blurred out, but it did pop up, and it said, "Don't worry, this will be higher resolution when it when it uh, publishes." Yeah, no, this is all like 4K. Don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> but hey, Kyle, thanks for joining me on this, you know, podcast. Um, if people want to learn more about you, where can they find you? Yeah, so just Kyle at salesoff.com. Send me an email. Um, I use a product that filters it out, but I check every weekend in the filter. So um, I'll respond to anything. Um, the shorter the email, the better. <laughs> and uh, love to be helpful however I can. And for all the, you, all the people that are listening out there that you know, want to streamline the way they go to market with their sales organization, check us out. We've got some incredible products now. Um, of course, the, the core engine of sales engagement is a cadence product. Um, but we also have a, sales, uh, a conversation intelligence product that records uh, Zoom, Skypes, GoToMeeting, WebExes, um, Google Meets, uh, Microsoft Teams, and transcribes the conversation you're, happening, you're having with your customer to text, allows you to search back through it, to coach, to um, get, gather insights. And then we've got a forecasting app as well. And uh, you know, we've really been able to, to build a great business in this new category that we've helped create. And uh, just last week, Forrester put us as leader in the category and we won uh, two out of the three criteria. And, and so we're in a good spot. And having a ton of fun and appreciate all your support. Appreciate you being a customer. Um, Appreciate everyone for listening and anything I can do to be helpful in any way, let me know. Well, Kyle, you're the man. Thanks again for, you know, joining me on this podcast and definitely rooting for your success. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Cheers.